Okay, let's start again. Hello, everyone. Um, today, uh, I'm here. I'm Davide Casali, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, remote teamwork, or even better, distributed teamwork. So when the entire company works from remote. And specifically, I want to bring you the experience from uh, WordPress.com, uh, which is the company uh, I work for right now. Well, the company is called Automatic, but the product uh, I work on is specifically WordPress.com. And quick background, I work uh, with in Automatic right now. I work with big consultancy, big agencies before. And I also co-founded a few projects, social projects, uh, open source projects. And I work right now also as an advisor for a few startups. So I'm saying this because the notions I'm telling you here, uh, I've already applied these from huge, huge companies to very, very tiny startups, even teams of one or two people. And of course, if you feel shy and you want, don't want to ask questions, uh, you can reach me on Folletto, double L, double T. So let's start. Uh, we need to start from what we called in a code name, uh, Calypso. Uh, what is Calypso? Uh, Calypso is an entire new ground up uh, rebuild of WordPress.com. Uh, it started in 2014. Uh, we decided that we needed an entirely new interface, an entirely new approach, both technical and design-wise. We wanted something modern, and we decided to scout a few different uh, approaches. So uh, for about uh, probably two weeks or so, um, our engineers tried to build prototypes with all the frameworks that were around, from Angular to React, and in the end, we settled with a Node.js React infrastructure. So Calypso is this amazing uh, interface that we actually open sourced last November. So pretty much the entire WordPress.com code base is public. And I'm working publicly, and everyone can see how we work and how we proceed and contribute to the project itself. Uh, it was a huge undertaking. Um, this snapshot was taken about uh, 20 months in when we actually did the open sourcing. Uh, we started on March 2014. And this snapshot was in November uh, 2015. So it's, it's really huge. If you think about it, 127 contributors, which means all from inside the company, mostly developers, but also designers, happiness engineers, and all uh, other contributors from inside the company. And consider the almost 7,000 reviews, which means that pretty much every piece of code that went in was reviewed by at least another person. And the question we get, we are right now we are a company that is 450 people, uh, and we have offices nowhere. We are entirely distributed. Um, everyone works from home or from a cafe, or from a co-working space. And the question we get is, how do we do that? How is it possible to be such a huge project um, in such a short time, being entirely distributed? There are some people. For some people, this is entirely impossible. So. The perspective, the way I want to tell this story is through the story of the showcase, which is specifically what my team worked on. We work on the theme showcase, which is the interface that you can use to select a theme, browse themes, and pick the features you want for your own website. Um, so let's start. This is Hyperion is my, the name of my team, uh, the team I lead. Uh, if you know the name, it's a hint to Dan Simmons' science fiction book, which I advise. It's pretty good. And here's the team. Now, it's sh it shuffled a, few, uh, a little in the last few months, but at the time, uh, this was the team. And this photo was taken at our company-wide meetup in Park City last year. So what is the problem? What were we trying to solve? Well, of course, we were shifting entire infrastructure. So that was a pretty good moment to make the, some changes. But the thing is that on WordPress.com, you have a wide selection of themes. You get hundreds of themes to choose between. Uh, and of course, it, for users, that's a really, that should be a really good experience, because it's something that um, some people do fairly often. For some of people, changing a theme, it's like changing a dress. So they change it really, really often. And for some other people, it's just finding the right one for their own website. So finding, discovering all these kind of things. And so we have what we call the showcase, right? So this is version two. 
And it's pretty good. You can see the screenshot. You can see more details. You can see a demo. Nothing too fancy, but it needs to work. It needs to be seamless. It needs to be simple. Problem is, we also have this one, which is codename THX, which then landed in WordPress.org. So it's now part of the open source project itself, not just .com. So we have two, but also we have three, actually. So we have also a version 4 that was released later, that was on the old platform. So this is still PHP, um, but we were trying to align and create a new uh, design language. As you can clearly imagine, this is a pretty, pretty messy situation from a code perspective. But even for the users, depending on the way you come into the, to the platform, you can get three very different experiences. So that was our goal. We are rebuilding the platform, so we are going to consolidate everything into one. And how do we do that? Of course, you start with planning. Now, we are a distributed company, so how do we plan in a distributed company such as this? Sometimes it happens online, sometimes it's simple enough to have a discussion. However, uh, it happens that every team in Automatic can do to up to about four meetups per year. So every team can freely decide to meet up together in a place all around the world and stay there for a few days working together. And we did exactly that. So in April last year, we met in Vienna. Uh, we had a few amazing days, but also we did workshops. Um, I don't know if you followed the, the, the talk yesterday or if you do workshop yourself, uh, but they're pretty, pretty good exercise to align and coordinate a team. We started with, uh, with this one, uh, which is a very simple exercise, just listing from a user perspective what are their pains. So in the current platform, what are the issues they're finding, which can be anything from an actual problem or an actual bug with the platform to concerns that the users may have in finding the right thing or doing what they want. And of course, the other thing is goals. So what they're trying to achieve by using this feature, by using this platform. And this is an initial exercise, so we get aligned. And the idea here is to set the ground for the next step, which is the planning phase. The approach we take, uh, I name it this like minimal milestone. So the idea here is that um, in the workshop, everyone writes down on post-its milestones. And the, the idea of the minimal milestone is that it's like the minimal viable product just applied to an individual milestone. So you just get one feature, one very focused feature, user perspective. So it's something that gives value back to the user. And of course, smaller fixes. But the important bit is just one main feature. And so we start aligning. So everyone writes this down, and then we bring all together in a single timeline, which you can see here in the middle that is starting to form up. Of course, some, some ideas are similar, some ideas are different, and some we want to do that earlier or later. And this, in about, I would say, two hours, was able to give us a very clear idea of where we wanted to go, what we want to do, and it was already granular enough to be doable the next day. To, we could start the next day. And of course, the, um, at the time, uh, members of the team never did these kind of workshops. And they found this kind of approach. If you never tried it, I would suggest to read The Game Storming. It's a great book explaining this approach. And they were super happy because now they had a very clear idea. Now we knew where, where to go in. We were all in agreement, and we could proceed forward. The thing is, in a distributed company, um, meetups, in a sense, don't exist until whatever happened in the meetup is actually transferred to the digital media. So we defined the roadmap, but that roadmap didn't exist until we actually posted on our internal uh, platform. And we use a thing called P2, which is basically a special kind of blog, which is um, like an activity stream for the team, and each team has a different P2. So aggregating these together, I can follow them on, on WordPress as a single stream, but also my own team has their own activity. And so we created this. Again, communicating is very important. So each milestone has a number, has a single or two words to describe it, and a one-liner 
describing what is going to happen in that milestone. So everyone in the company, from the moment this gets posted, now is aware of what we're doing and what we're going to do. Everyone is aligned. And of course, we start with the first milestone. So how does this happen? The first thing, again, we start saying, and it's like a testament, so we're saying uh, we are starting milestone one, and we do that through what we call the master thread, which again, not surprisingly, is just a post with a special kind of content that states uh, um, estimated time of arrival, designs, all the links and all the notes relevant to that milestone. So if someone wants to see, every information needed is there. And we start with design. So what we started here was just, again, another post. The design was ready. We started with a very, very simple flow. So we analyzed all the possible activities. We nailed down the few most important ones. And we created, um, in this specific case, uh, an interactive PDF. So it's just a PDF you can download, but the special thing about it is that you can click it around exactly as you would do with a website. It's very simple to build. It takes a moment to export, and you have it. Now, of course, different approaches could be used. You could use Marvel. Other teams use very different tools. It doesn't matter. You can prototype directly in code. Uh, we have this kind of flexibility. Every team can do whatever they want as long as it works. So the next thing, we posted this. So the discussion started. We got 25 comments, a fair number of likes. So we gathered already a really, really good amount of feedback, which means that uh, the design could go on. And at the same time, we started our Kanban board on Trello. Um, so the development now could start with, the, with the laying the groundwork. So architecture, structure, APIs, uh, so everything that comes before uh, starting even touching the initial design, since we were still working on that. So in a sense, we were working in parallel. And of course, the design goes forward. Iteration two, another wireframe, another interactive PDF. Now, way more pages, because we went into the detail of the actual flows and the actual actions that could happen all around. And of course, again, some feedback, a fair number of likes again, few discussions, still a few things to tweak. But now we actually knew that the approach we were taking was solid. So even if we don't, didn't have any more specific there, uh, we already knew what was the direction we wanted to cover. So iteration three jumped now into pixel-perfect uh, visualizations. The interesting bit is that um, the approach we used here was a single huge screenshot where the individual screens were displayed and the arrows to map out the flows. Uh, which is very, it's, you can do that mostly because we narrow down to very small milestones. So the two things are correlated. If you're building something bigger, probably you couldn't use this kind of approach. And the interesting bit is that the moment you visualize it, way more people come to give feedback. Because now that I see the pixels, they can start saying, oh, okay, now you get what was that square thing you got in the wireframes. I understand now. And so while in a static mock-up you don't see the actual flows because you cannot click around, where well, I could upload to Marvel probably, but it was in the stage of the process. So we got more feedback. The discussion was heated again. So while the development was going forward, so we started building a few pieces of the infrastructure, um, we are actually able to start releasing a few pieces internally. So because, yes, the design was still progressing, but at the same time, there were enough pieces there that we were able to show some uh, themes, some of the interaction in code, in real live code, to the company internally. Uh, of course, this was just a test. We, we wasn't yet at the stage of a proper test. But the idea of this being live meant that I could send a link to anyone else in the company and ask their feedback instantly. Another thing that happened my, what, meanwhile we were working on this is that we actually discovered that one of the milestones, we were, we were planning like four milestones later, M4, was actually already done by a different team. Which you may, you may argue that, okay, there was a problem of coordination there, but actually it just means that um, the way we're approaching things, they were able to finish the part of work, which was the purchases flow, 
before us. So we just said, okay, you know what? Given they already built most of it, we can add a week of work to milestone one, and we have it. So we, we do one milestone less, and we have the feature straight off in milestone one. And of course, we updated the roadmap, so now everyone was, again, aware of what was the plan going forward. And then iteration four of the design is interesting here because instead of doing another post, uh, we actually shared uh, the designs we were working on on Slack directly because there were a few smaller details to discuss, but also because a few of the people here were people that were working directly, one on Android and one on iOS. So the idea there was starting to coordinate and make sure that nothing that we were actually doing on the web platform was actually entirely against things that were happening on Android and iOS. So it was, while we weren't yet designing properly the Android and iOS experience, we wanted to make sure that uh, the design was ready to be converted to the individual platform uh, and the individual patterns that existed on these platforms. So the iteration four happened there, so, and the iteration five was then again posted on P2, because again, available to everyone to see. And this time, of course, there were more flows. There was a hint of iOS and Android here, slightly different, adapting the visual patterns. And it was great because this doesn't happen actually often. Uh, but the only feedback we got was that's a lovely bl blueprint, very nice. So we knew we were done for milestone one. Um, so what was left was finishing the work building the last few features for a few more weeks, and reaching a stage where we do two things now. Uh, one thing was an internal release, so we more details, and we asked everyone in the company, please test this feature. We, it's about to go live. Try it, stress it, do whatever you want, um, and report us every bug you find. But also we have another platform called Horizon, uh, which is horizon.wordpress.com, um, which is a public platform. So everyone outside the company that subscribed to Horizon Feedback was able to actually give us feedback about what we were about to release. So we got a, a big pool from both internally and externally, pe uh, the people around. And of course, the, the external people are usually kind of very... Um, senior people, very expert people. Uh, so we knew that it was a slightly skewed experience, but we also knew that that kind of people are also the ones that would stress the platform the most. So after a few weeks, we launched it. We use actually Neon Cats to mark our milestones in my team. Uh, and this was the Neon Cat we chose at the time. And in numbers, we got a fairly big amount of feedback if you consider all considered. So more than 100 comments, explicitly uh, 17 people from both outside and inside the company that actually tested live all the flows in a proper user testing environment. And not considering, of course, all the feedback we got on the design iterations. And this lasted basically about 3.5 months. So in 3.5 months, we had a minimal product going live on Calypso, the new infrastructure, starting from the meetup itself. And given this was a rebuild process, uh, every time we work on a feature, every time we work on something, we tend to take care about metrics, of course, KPIs. But in this case, because it was a replacement, it is a replacement, our only concern was we need to make sure that the sales don't go down. So we'll think about growth later, because it's the most important thing is replacement and new, the new infrastructure. But the sales didn't go down, at, at, except for a beginning where it's kind of normal. Um, and so we were in a really good position. People were happy, feedback was happy, sales were still stable. And of course, as on the side, we also finished up the Android and iOS version that is for different teams, though. My teams that are just the, the web side of, of things. So I give you an overview of, of the work. It may not be that different from uh, what you do day to day in an abstract sense. Um, 
but consider that this all happened online, digitally, and completely distributed way. So there are certain principles that were behind this whole process. And the first thing before starting listing the principles is that what I call the remoteness continuum, which means that a lot of people are local, so everyone is in one place working together, and that's fine, that's a great solution. And other companies like us are entirely distributed. Um, the, the way we're distributed means that there is no place anywhere around the world where there is an actual office. We have an event space in San Francisco, but it's not an office. So the actual difficult bit is actually when you are in the middle. So all the scenarios where there is an office, but also there are people that are remote. That, in a, in, in a sense, is the worst case scenario because it's the scenario where it creates two tires of people, and so any kind of um, process you put in practice needs to compensate from the fact that a few people are local and a few people are remote. Instead, the two extremes means that everyone is on the same boat, which so makes things easier. In a sense, because if the company grows enough, you're already becoming a remote company. Because the moment the teams, the moment the people, the moment the organization starts splitting on multiple floors, on multiple buildings, in multiple cities, you already have a situation where people are remote. So this is a problem that I encountered a few times in consulting where a growing company was still thinking of themselves as local, while in reality, they were already a remote company, and they weren't putting in place the necessary principles, processes, infrastructure to make this work. And so it created a lot of tension. So what are these principles? Um, the first set of principles are around culture. So the first bit works out very well for us, uh, at least, is transparency. All the P2 posts, everything I did, everything that is available, was shared in the whole company. So anyone regardless of the team could see my work and comment on it if they had a good idea. So this takes away a lot of effort in segmenting, a lot of issues in uh, creating walls, a lot of issues. Everyone sees everything. It's simple as that. And if you have a problem with that, maybe you have a problem at a different level of the company. Because why you need to segment information from people you already trust? The other bit is initiative. Um, the kind of people we tend to hire are people that have a lot of individual initiative. They're able to bring forward, even, they, even if they don't have anything to work on, they will find something to work on, and they will work on it. And this also applies to team level. Every team in the company is independent. So my team, in the scope we have, which is again, themes and, and customization, we have complete freedom to decide what we want to work on. And our decision is the final decision. Of course, we can get feedback from outside, and of course, if the CEO comes to us and tells us something, we need to consider that. But our word is final in that sense. We don't need to check with anyone else. And of course, the last bit, communication is oxygen. Because as you've seen, we write a lot, there are a lot of posts around, and conciseness and effectiveness in text and written communication is very, very important. It makes a whole world of difference. The second bit is about support. So one thing that I already showed you is we did a meetup in Vienna. And we do a lot of meetups. Every team does, as I said, up to four meetups per year. This is very important, not just because you can work together and decide things together and do workshop and do activities together, but, but also because you start knowing the people. And so it takes away the kind of effect where you read a line of text that seems rude, but now you know the person. So you know that that's just their way they express themselves and they don't mean anything troublesome or they're not really trying to make a fuss. That's just how they talk. And that's super important because when you have a team with a person coming from a culture in, for example, San Francisco, and a person coming from Bulgaria or India or Japan, there, there are also very different cultural differences there. 
Um, so meetups helps hugely to address all these problems. And of course, we treat everything as remote. Even things that happen in person are always remote. Uh, a colleague of mine tell, told me a story where part of his team, a big part, except for a couple of people, was in San Francisco for a meetup. Uh, they had to do this call. So most of the people were there. So he was expecting to find a room together, start a call together, and connect the other people from uh, remote. Instead, what happened was, okay, everyone gets into a different room, we start a call separately, and we join as we were remote. Even if most of the people were exactly in the same place, it could have been in the same room. In that way, it avoided any kind of off-channel communication. That is normal to happen if you are already all together in one room. That's I think it's very exemplary to show how strong is the principle to treat everything as being remote. And the last bit is about culture is water cooler space. Um, sometimes engineering cultures are very, very efficiency driven. So they take every discussion that happens needs to be a product discussion, needs to be about the stuff we need. And an off shot sentence in a channel is taken as something that shouldn't happen because why should I talk about what I'm about to eat in the team channel? Well, that's important. That's why people meet around the coffee. That's why people chat together at lunch. That brings people and teams together. And these spaces in a digital and a remote environment needs to be acknowledged and created. And the last bit is about tools. So the way I explain tools is usually that you need three speeds of tools. The first bit is the real time. So you need a way to chat each other right here, right now, discuss a problem quickly, find a solution together. This is addressed um, with channels like uh, Slack, chats, IRC, uh, Facebook Messenger, doesn't matter. It's a real time thing. It can be even a phone call. The second speed is a synchronous speed. It's what's usually taken from um, platforms like Podio or uh, Social Cast or all these kind of platforms that have activity stream with posts. Uh, we use P2, for example. And the last one is stable. It's the kind of information that is written, available to everyone, but doesn't really need a discussion. It's not in the flow. And this is usually covered by wikis, by the kind of repository, long-term repository, file repositories. Um, this is our own setup. So we use Slack for the real-time speed, uh, P2, which is this special WordPress theme for each team. And we have a special theme for the wiki inside the company as well. And you will find that every company that works well always, always have these three speeds. Even if they're not acknowledging it, sometimes I went to do consulting to companies and we say, oh, we don't have anything to, to discuss together. Oh, by the way, the, the asynchronous speed, oh, we are using email. Email is asynchronous speed. So you're already covering that. So if you use email and you use phone calls, you're already covering two speed. It doesn't have to be a two software tool. And of course, I acknowledge that interactions and processes happen outside the actual formal processes you build. Automatic is probably very extreme. When you join automatic, we say, welcome to the chaos because every team has freedom to decide whatever is efficient for them. But, of course, this is just an acknowledgement that outside a few very key elements of processes, it's very important to acknowledge that whatever works, works. And if a team works better in a, with a certain approach, it's better that they have their custom way to do things. To summarize, we have this like, three level thing, so one extreme local, on the other extreme fully distributed, and all the spectrum of companies in the middle, and these three big uh, buckets of principles. So what I've found is that these principles may vary a little bit depending on remote companies. So for example, I found fully distributed companies that weren't as transparent as we were, um, but when you bring it all together, you notice that, for example, transparency is strictly tied to efficient communication. Because everything is available, everyone can read it transparently, so I don't need to 
forward the same information to someone else outside this specific closed channel because someone else needs to read it. They will read it or I just send a link. Done. Very simple, very effective. And so they interplay fairly well in another. And you also find that, for example, meetups, pretty much every single fully distributed company I know does meetups. They do that in different ways. We do like team meetups plus one meetup with a whole company every year. Other companies do like twice a year whole company meetups. Doesn't matter. They all do this kind of physical in-person encounters because they're important and make the distributed company work. Um, so I think we're toward the end. Just to mention that we are looking for pretty much every kind of job roles we have in the company. Um, and I think we're done. Thank you very much. So questions. Anyone has? Yes. So I'll try to aim straight. Let's see. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> okay. Uh, how do you do uh, deal with uh, apprentices or uh, uh, juniors uh, in remote teams? Uh, or can you do that in your company? Right. Yes, very good question. Uh, I would say that the, the way we dealt with that so far is not to hire juniors. Uh, that said, there were a few. Uh, it happens because there were people that were really too good to let them pass. Um, and so what happened is that there is, again, not, formal, not a formal process. And I'm actually going to work on that a little bit in the next few weeks because we have a new person joining. Um, but the idea is that we do, we have actually a fairly exhaustive information uh, on our wiki. So there is a lot of information there to start with. So the static bits, the bits you can read about, are there. And then we tend to do pairing. Uh, so even if we, we, if we don't do like a proper, like extreme programming kind of pairing, uh, we try to encourage that. So you can do uh, very easily with even Hangouts or Skype or whatever, you can do pretty closely uh, that kind of iterations. Um, I would say, however, that properly junior, junior people still never happen, I would say, in the company. Because even juniors, they were pretty good at what they were doing already. So it was mostly a matter to help them to focus on the way we did things, more than how to train them to become um, a better professional. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Anything else? Yeah, there one. It's a long one. <laughs> Okay, hi. Hello. Uh, so my question will be, I think, extension of uh, a colleague's question. Basically, uh, how do you distinguish between who to hire or who not? Basically, what's the point uh, where you say that, okay, he is good enough that he can work remotely with you? Okay, we, we have probably one, in my perspective, we have one of the best hiring processes I've seen so far. There are probably better processes. Um, but there are actually two ways, in a sense. So our hiring process is, works in this way. Uh, all the CVs are forwarded to Matt, which is the CEO and founder. He reads everything. Quickly, but he reads everything. The CVs that for him are good are passed internally to one of our committees. So we have a developer group, a designers group, and a happiness uh, engineering group, and probably an operations one. And then this team do an initial interview. And then the important bit there is that we start uh, a trial, which is paid work. So we pay for that. And it, it lasts about 40 hours, usually a small sized projects for 40 hours, uh, which you can do in four days if you want, or you can do in two months. So that's to give the flexibility. If you're already working on something, you probably don't want to leave work to just work on our trial, right? So in that period of time, um, you're able to work directly and in exactly the same way we are working. Um, and so the interesting bit about this is that we have a, 
a fairly high dropout rate from this stage, but not because we reject them, but because a few people say, I cannot work in this way. So the trier works for us to see if there is a good relationship, if they work well and everything, but also works very well from them to say, can I really work entirely distributed? Some people can't, it's perfect. They discover it at that stage, and so they drop off. Uh, and then after that, there is the final interview again with, uh, with Matt. So he again checks at the end, uh, and that's it. Um, I, I think we have a fairly good uh, hit rate in this way. But the second thing, which is interesting, uh, is that given the fact that everything we do, we try to do in open source. So as I mentioned before, Calypso is entirely open source. You can see my own design threads on GitHub, right? And the discussion we have in and everything. So it means that you can actually start by jumping in either to WordPress.org, so the open source PHP traditional one, or Calypso, and start engaging with us. And fairly, with a fair amount of times, the people that show their work and how good they are in the open source environment, it's usually a very good fit as well. So some people don't want to join us. Some other people are just just come to join us because they're so good and demonstrated that already. So there is no need to, to look further. They were already good and we already know, everyone already knows it. So with, between these two, um, I think we have a very, a fairly, it's not perfect, of course, uh, but we have a very good, good hit rate, I think. I hope it answers your question. Uh, yes, thank you. Thanks. Uh, if nobody has, okay. Yeah, one, two. Hi, I am very Hello. curious about the fact um, the difficulties is working in um, the very distributed um, company. Um, I am I'm very curious because I work in GNOME, mm -hmm. in GNOME Foundation. This is a completely distributed all, all around the world and uh, I found very comfortable. So um, what is the problem in working in, uh, in, in such a company? I think that so at the, I would say the company-wide level, um, the problems are, I found that are very similar to the, any problem that a fairly good, a fairly big company has. So communication issues, that kind of issue, propagation of information are pretty similar. Uh, we're probably more efficient than others, exactly because we're fully transparent. But that side of things, I haven't found any problem that is specific to us, in a sense. Um, the problems I found specific to us and specific to distributed work are the ones related to individuals. So, for example, it's, it's very difficult for, for most of the people to be able to plan their day. Because on one side, uh, so one side we have uh, open vacation policy, we have no specific time frame so we can work anytime, anywhere we want. Um, which this much of freedom also means that, okay, so can I start at 12 and work until I want to? Yeah, of course you can. Uh, so, and the solution to that, so because that gives a lot of anxiety to people saying, am I doing this right? Is, is good, I'm doing enough, I'm doing too much. Um, and I think for most of people it's an oscillation, they start doing too much and they then try to fix that. and. Um, some people, like me, tend to fix the start of the day in some way. So I, start, I try to always say, I start the day exactly at this time every day, and then I just go on as long as I, as I want. Uh, other people I know just time themselves, just to make sure they're not overdoing. Um, other people are very comfortable with that, so they don't care much, <laughs> and I envy them. But so, there is, I think that that one is probably individually one of the biggest problems. Um, and the other one is, in a sense, recognition. Um, because the fact that there is no, you, you're not bumping into each other in the office, right? So it's very difficult to have all these positive acknowledgements that you're doing a good work. So we are actually actively working to um, being more proactive in saying we're doing a good work. When, of course, that happens, <laughs> it's, not, it's not given. Um, because criticism is normal and it happens all the time because if you're doing something that doesn't work, of course, someone will tell you. Uh, but if you're doing something good, uh, 
it's less normal for people to say you did something good. So we need to reinforce that also because I, I would say that we have a fairly high amount of people with imposter syndrome. Um, so all these things interplay fairly, fairly together. So I would say that these two are the things. Another detail is time zones, which makes, again, planning the day very hard. Because, for example, living in Europe as I am, it means that most of the people, when they're waking up in the US, they're starting working. So I, it's very easy for me to just follow them along. But then it's, it's 1 AM in the morning, and people in Japan are waking up. And like, OK, now I need to stop it somewhere. <laughs> right? So there's probably one last question, I think, behind. Mm, are there any uh, legal difficulties in employing people in s different jurisdictions, and how do you deal with it? OK, I can answer a little bit superficially, because I'm not into the operations team. But um, as far as I know, um, the, the current setup works in this way. Um, everyone around the world gets, if there is no incorporation, incorporated company in the country, everyone around the world is hired as a freelance. In that way, it kind of simplifies things from an operation perspective, it's, but it's a little more challenging for the individual. Uh, and so they try to make it easy, as easy as possible, uh, the, whole, the whole thing. But basically, legally, it's just there is a company that is hiring you uh, full time, even, even if it's freelancing, uh, to do uh, um, any kind of work that you may get requested uh, during, the, during your engagement. Uh, so it's an indefinite contract, and it's just a freelance contract. And it's tied to the individual nations, but in that sense, since it's a US company that is sending a contract over, it's still a US company that responds in terms of legal, uh, the legal things, um, as far as I know, at least. In, in company, then we decide that when we have roughly five people in a country, our operation teams uh, start checking uh, to incorporate a business there. Uh, in that way, it makes the life for anyone in, the, in, the, in that country easier because anything from taxation to healthcare to getting a mortgage gets easier if you are actually employed in a company in the country. Uh, and that is basically requires a lookup specific for each country. Uh, so as far as I know, they have one person inside a company that starts scouting for um, someone on the ground that can help all the legal, uh, the legal details, and they try to map whichever works uh, across it. So far, we have, I think, five incorporations all around the world, though. It's not that many. Thank you. So I think we're done. We can go. Thank you very much.